Hello and welcome to the last Open Box Science seminar this year. My name is Jerry Lin. I'm a co-founder of Open Box Science and today's moderator. This is a special event because uh, it is the first neuroscience protocol seminar co-hosted by Star Protocols and Open Box Science. Star Protocols is a new open access journal at Cell Press. So in this webinar, we will be hearing two uh, recently published star protocols uh, authors to present um, their star protocols. If you have questions, you can unmute and ask your questions during the Q&A. We hope such live transparent step-by-step um, -step instructions will be useful for our um, audience. So uh, before we get started, um, I'd like to invite the assistant editor at Star Protocols Dr. Ming Yu Sun to briefly introduce the journal. Uh, thanks so much, Jerry. Um, so let me share my screen very quick. Um, so is that full mode right now? Okay. Yes. Cool. Thanks. Um, so. Um, we are uh, Star Protocols uh, is an open access peer reviewed cell press journal and we launched uh, in 2019. Uh, so if you go to our website here, starprotocols.cell.com, you can see that this is our index page. So um, from the index page, you can see that so far we have about 972 pro protocols here. And we also offer some functionality for users to search our protocols, uh, such as uh, searching by categories. So you can see that on the sidebar, there are a few categories here so that you can select the categories to search the protocols that suit your need. So in addition to that, you can also search by keywords. So you can type in keywords in the this searching bar here, so we can, you can also search your protocols that way. So recently, we are very excited to uh, create a platform called Q and A platform. Uh, so this platform uh, uh, is serving as a resource to help early scientists to troubleshoot any questions they have with uh, protocols. So so far, we have those two um, Q and A. Uh, collections. Uh, those are topic-based Q&A. So the first one is about flow cytometry, and the second one is about CRISPR. So if you click the CRISPR um, uh, link, you can see that this is the Q&A, uh, how the Q&A looks like. So um, you can see there's a list of the questions, and you can click each question to uh, find out all the answers provided by Star Protocols authors. So if you find your questions not included in the list, there's no problem. You can uh, click um, uh, ask a question button from this pop up um, here, so you can submit your own question that way. So in addition to this topic-based Q&A, we also have an article-based Q&A. So if you click some of the individual, some, uh, if you click individual protocols, uh, you can see again a pop-up here asking whether you have any questions. So you can submit your question that way to a specific protocols. So once you uh, submit your questions, we will get an application and we will forward your questions to others. So here I'm taking Evan's protocol as an example. So we do receive some questions for Evan. So here he also provides some of his answers here. So you can see that we provide a Q&A session for this specific protocol. And another very exciting feature for Star Protocols is that we offer reviewer opportunities for young scientists. So if you are a PhD student or postdoc looking for reviewer opportunities, uh, feel free to contact us to register as a volunteer reviewer. So the way you can register is that you can go to our cell.com website here, and then there's a link um, uh, for you to register as a reviewer. And you can also see these pop-up windows. Uh, this is another way that you can register as a reviewer. So finally, again, we would like to thank Open, open Box Science um, for this opportunity. And we are so uh, feel so honored uh, to have this opportunity to collaborate with um, Open Box Science to co-host co this uh, protocol seminars. So feel free to contact us uh, through our emails and Twitter here. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Sun. That sounds a great opportunity. 
for, for uh, trainees to become a volunteer, a volunteer reviewer. So let me share my screen again. Okay. So if you are interested in getting involved in hosting such seminars, you could volunteer to speak, suggest a protocol, or join the host team. So not just uh, research protocol seminars, Open Park Science also organize seminars, highlight research papers, and review articles. So as a group, we will work together to organize a webinar step-by-step -step on your own schedule. So such uh, volunteer experience will not only look good on your CV, but presents a great opportunity to meet other scientists. So now it's my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Dr. Evan Bort. Evan is an instructor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School based in the Louis, uh, Louis Center for Autism at Massachusetts General Hospital. He was trained as a mitochondrial biologist in the laboratory of Dr. Brian Poulter at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. After earning his doctoral degree, he moved to Boston and joined the laboratory of Dr. Stacy Bilbo at Mass General Hospital as a postdoc. He is focusing on sex differences in microglial development. Today, he's going to show us how to isolate microglia from mouse and human brains. Evan, please take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Jerry. Let me share my screen. And can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Jerry, for the introduction. Um, like you said, my name is Evan, and I'm a new PI based at the Lurie Center for Autism at Mass General Hospital. And I just wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me to just chat a little bit today about one of the methods that we use to isolate microglia. So I'm sure that just about everyone who is here um, knows about microglia, the innate immune cells of the central nervous system. And I always like to just show these videos from Demetrius Davalos of in vivo two photon imaging of microglial surveillance behaviors at baseline, as well as in response to a laser injury. And I think that these two videos just do a fantastic job of highlighting that these cells not only react to brain perturbations, but are also highly motile and active even in the healthy brain. Now I'm going to give about probably 30 seconds of microglial um, background here and then just kind of dive right into the protocol itself. But microglia are heavily involved in the sculpting of neural circuitry and they are perhaps, they are best defined in the role in pruning synapses in the developing brain in an activity dependent manner. And then probably the more classical role in which people think of microglia is their response to brain injury or disease. And there are alterations in microglia in a whole variety of disorders and degenerative, degenerative diseases, such as evidenced here in postmortem motor cortex from individuals diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder compared to neurotypical controls. So microglia are obviously an important and growing area of study. So if we want to study these cells, how do we go about this study? And one of the most common methods that is used to isolate microglia is using fax sorting based off of the antigen CD11B and CD45, wherein microglia are defined as cells that are positive for CD11B and are low in CD45 expression whereas peripheral macrophages that can infiltrate into the brain are also positive for CD11B, but are high for CD45 expression. And while this is truly a fantastic technique and has been widely employed, and we regularly fact sort for microglial isolations, there are also numerous lines of evidence that this flow sorting can upregulate expression of immediate early genes such as CFOS, as well as pro-inflammatory genes and other markers that have kind of classically been referred to as what some people will call activation markers. And as we can see here in two just beautiful papers from Ann Schaefer and Stefan Young's group, we can see that this fact sorting is upregulating these pro-inflammatory and immediate early genes. So while, like I said, we do regularly fact sort for these microglial isolations, we also use another technique that we believe may be more gentle in particular instances, 
and that is to use magnetic bead-based column enrichment for microglia. And that is the protocol that I'm going to be walking through today. So I thought that I would just show this graphical abstract as a, <coughs> excuse me, um, as a really just rough outline for the protocol here. But really, it's quite a simple workflow. Uh, we start by dissociating our tissues down to the single cell level. We remove debris and myelin depending upon our downstream workflow. And then we use magnetic beads and columns to enrich for our labeled cells. And we then collect these cells for downstream usages. And while we have three general workflows, they all start off in the exact same way. And that is to, I'm going to say, to simply dissociate our tissue. I think you'll see that it, there's nothing simple about it. And it's probably the most controversial aspect of microglial isolation is how you dissociate tissues. But like I said, there are many different ways in which we can dissociate our tissues. And we have tried multiple ways in the lab over the years. And unfortunately, perhaps the one that we keep coming back to is that we use successively smaller and smaller flame polished pipettes. Um, I think most of you are probably familiar with flame polishing pipettes, as you can see in this video on the left here. And essentially what we're trying to do is use shear force by using smaller and smaller um, openings in these flame polished pipettes in order to dissociate our tissue down to the single cell level. And the nature of hand flaming these pipettes as we do means that we don't have an exact measurement for our opening sizes, but generally these are about three quarters of a micron, half a micron, and one quarter of a micron in size. And there are obviously a whole host of alternatives for dissociation to our flame polished pipettes. Um, probably one of the more common alternatives that we have seen is this um, gentle max dissociator by the company Miltenyi. And we've been able to get very similar results as our gentle flame polished method using this dissociator. But I will say that we've had to very heavily modify their protocol, uh, use a lot more volume than what they suggest. And we have just found that our kind of laborious but hand polished um, um, flame polished pipette method has just proved much easier and more reproducible for us. So if we're using mouse brains, we first do a transcardial perfusion on our mice using ice cold saline to clear the vasculature of as much blood as we can. Um, obviously for eye quick reasons, I'm not showing the perfusion process, but feel free to reach out if that is something that you have any questions about. And we then dissect out our brain region of choice and mince it on a petri dish on ice with fine scissors. And we then place it into our enzyme digestion mix on ice. And you can see here and also in the protocol itself that our enzyme mix consists of HBSS, FBS, HEPIs, and the enzymes collagenase and DNAs. And you can see in the video here, just an example of how we are pipetting up and down. And we do this with these consistently smaller and smaller pipettes with heated incubation times in between each series of pipettes in order to get this down to a single cell level. And on the right here, we can see sort of what this tissue from, I believe this was the prefrontal cortex of um, several pulled mouse brains, both before and after our dissociation. So just kind of getting a sense of what this can look like. And although our lab has tried to implement microglial isolations using mechanical dissociation, and the gentle max, these are both heated enzyme digestion mixed based dissociation methods. And we have also tried to use mechanical dissociation um, with a dounce homogenizer at four degrees. So just on ice. And we have encountered, unfortunately, several limitations using this technique. Um, first, despite many attempts, we are often unable to attain a comparable yield between our cold dissociations and our warm enzymatic digestions wherein we see that our warm en enzymatic digestions are resulting in about two times as many cells compared to when we cold dissociate. And we have also noticed that cells that are maintained um, on ice at four degrees during the separation process kind of surprisingly appear less healthy. Um, one example that we are showing here is we are just flow staining for live dead, so looking at the percent viable cells. And we see that our warm dissociation protocol has a far higher number of viable cells than did our cold dissociation protocol. <coughs> Excuse me. And we also see that, interestingly, this cold dissociation protocol did not lead to as 
solid of a production of single cells. And when we look for singlets by flow in either our cold dissociation or our warm dissociation, we see a far greater proportion of singlets with our warm dissociation. And there's actually about 20% of the cells were doublets when we used our cold dissociation down homogenization. So this is just in our hands, but just wanted to show some potential caveats to cold versus warm dissociation. And there are also obviously so many questions about dissociation, dissociation methods that we as a field are sure to go much deeper into over the next few years. And one of which that I'm just truly very excited about is this beautiful work by Sam Marsh, Beth Stevens, and other collaborators that assesses microglial activation state dependent upon dissociation methods. So like I was saying earlier, we use a heated enzymatic method for some of the reasons I was explaining above, but Sam has actually shown that these enzymes can have an effect on microglial ex vivo activation. And interestingly, there's an inclusion of certain translation inhibitors, which you can read their just beautiful paper about that the inclusion of these translation inhibitors can really help improve this ex vivo activation state. Uh, we have not yet tested our particular method by single cell sequencing with these new inhibitors, but I think that this is something that we as a field need to really do quickly and just come to a decision on what the best dissociation methods, temperatures, just everything about them in order to really get the best downstream applications. So after we get our tissue dissociated, however you may want to dissociate your tissue, we generally have three distinct workflows that we use that are depending upon the downstream applications as well as our input material. And the simplest is when we really are only caring about RNA applications, such as some simple qPCRs. And what we care most about in this case is speed. And for that, we are simply skipping a lot of the cleanup steps that I'm about to talk about next. And the first of those steps, um, so for some other applications or for older animals who generally have a lot more myelin in their brain, we either remove debris or start to enrich for mononuclear cells using a Parkall gradient. And I have tried both of these methods, and I believe that either is quite workable for the majority of downstream applications, um, especially if you're following up with further enrichment strategies like we will. But for most sample types, I prefer to use, it's called a debris removal solution, again, from this Miltenyi company. And it's simply because it's incredibly easy to use. So the reason I prefer to use this is, like I said, it's just so simple. You simply resuspend your cell pellet in a mixture of their debris removal solution and ice cold PBS, and then you gently overlay more PBS. Um, it's incredibly important that you do this very gently and slowly as the interface of this gradient will be where the removed cells and debris locate. And little tricks that most people probably know when layering out gradients, but I find it easiest to start at a 45 degree angle, kind of like seen in the link in this video, and then you just slowly bring the tube more and more vertical as you raise the volume of PBS. And that generally allows for you to have a just more distinct gradient. And the real beauty of this method, at least to me, is that you can centrifuge for around 3000 Gs for 10 minutes, and you can use a relatively high acceleration and break. So it saves a lot of time for the overall method compared to the normal half an hour or so, and then no break of most gradient centrifugations that you can get into. And you can then see that it's quite easy to simply aspirate off the top layer and the debris layer, after which you can then do another PBS wash and centrifugation. Um, and I think you can see here on the left, the initial layering, it's quite obvious and it's very easy to get a strong distinct layer. And this is what this looks like after centrifugation where you have your PBS layer, your layer of myelin and other cell debris, and then you have your cells in your debris remo removal solution on the bottom here. And I should have included a flow plot here, but we have consistently found using live dead stains of cells with flow cytometry, like I showed previously, that there's about 90 to 95% viability of these cells um, following the debris removal solution. So it's a really pure, clean um, cell population at this step. And while that would be my preferred method just due to ease and speed, Another method that we often use in the lab is to enrich for mononuclear cells using a percol density gradient. One tissue type that we've noticed that this method works far better for is when you are isolating embryonic tissues, such as an embryonic brain. 
And for some reason that I am just not sure about, but we've seen it consistently and across multiple labs. But when we try to use the debris removal solution on embryonic brains, we just, our yield is essentially nothing. So we have to use a percol gradient method, kind of this more classical density centrifugation method. And how we do this is we resuspend our cell suspensions in 30% percol, and we add it to a fresh 15 mil, <coughs> excuse me, conical tube. And then we want to underlay our 30% percol solution with 70% percol. And this is probably my least favorite part of using percol because if you mix the layers here, it's incredibly difficult to fix. And as we can see the method here in this video, um, you are essentially just underlaying your cells on 30% percol with this 70% percol using a pasture pipette method. And then what we do is you centrifuge these tubes for 20 minutes, but you then use the slowest acceleration and no break. So it takes much closer to about 30 to 35 minutes for the centrifugation process. And then we can see here on the right, the resulting layers where there's a layer of myelin at the very top, there's your cell interface, and there's generally a layer of red blood cells at the very bottom. And we can use transfer pipettes to carefully pipette out this interphase layer, after which we do a wash very similar to that done at the end of the debris removal step. And then after this point is where all of our protocols converge again. And it's really quite an easy next step where essentially we aspirate the supernatant from our previous washes, and we resuspend the pellets with max buffer, and then we add microbeads. And depending upon what your downstream application is, you can use different microbeads. If you're doing just a very basic macrophage isolation, you could use these CD11B microbeads. Uh, we, again, buy these from Milteni. They work very well for mice and humans, and there are separate beads that work very well for rat brain isolations. And we generally use a nine to one <clears throat> Um, so 90 microliters of max and 10 microliters of microbead. However, we have found that if you have larger amounts of starting tissues, then you can increase the amount of max in beads. And I have generally found that there's no real negative to using these increased volumes. And the only real negative is cost. So you can kind of titrate the amounts to your specific needs, but we generally use this nine to one ratio. So after mixing the max and the microbead solution well, we let them incubate on ice for 15 minutes, after which we just add some more max and centrifuge. And as the bead labeled cells are spinning, we set up our max columns and magnets, as you can see here. And note that we prefer to refilter our samples at this point um, prior to adding them to the columns. We just have found that it really helps with any potential contamination issues that you may have. And it is at this point that our magnetically labeled beads. So if we labeled for a CD11B, um, microglia and other macrophages expressing CD11B will stick in the column that is on the magnet, while everything that is not labeled or our non-microglial population will pass through. <coughs> and then once the non-labeled cells have passed through the magnet exposed column, we collect our labeled cells. So just being cognizant of speed, we want to remove our columns from the magnet and place them over a fresh tube to collect the positive cells, aka the cells that were labeled with the magnetic beads. And then we just add max buffer and very forcefully and quickly. And we have noticed that strangely force and speed really do matter here for getting these cells out of the columns. But essentially we're doing this plunger based method where we add in max to these columns that are no longer on the magnet and we are able to plunge out the labeled cells. So plunge out our microglial population. And this is really it for this protocol. It's really quite simple. Um, at this point you have your negative and your positive populations. And we generally just do a quick wash in PBS to remove some of the BSA that is in the max buffer and can be a contaminant for downstream applications. And then we resuspend in our media of choice for our downstream application. Um, so I just wanted to touch on a few more aspects of this protocol before really wrapping up. And we just get a sense here of the typical yields that we get from several different brain regions. 
Um, I did want to mention here that our adults here aren't really adults. Uh, they more start around postnatal day 30 in mice. So larger animals will generally give more cells, but you can get a sense here and all these figures are in the protocol for general cell yields that we are getting of microglia from these different brain regions. And one in really important caveat that we have actually updated our protocol rather dramatically since the publication of this STAR protocols revolves around the fact that in the healthy young adult mouse brain, our protocol pulls down very pure microglia, as we can see here by the flow graphs here. Um, remember that microglia are classically defined as cells that are positive for CD11B and low for CD45, whereas these infiltrating macrophages are CD11B positive and CD45 high. So we can use a variety of markers such as fractalkine CX3CR1 as well to show that these cells are really quite pure. And in the healthy brain, this is a fantastic method for pulling down just microglia. But while this method is all well and good for a truly healthy young brain, you can run into problems when there are any perturbations, which we know can increase peripheral immune cell infiltration into the brain. And one instance that we see here is a peripheral injection of the bacterial endotoxin lipopolysaccharide or LPS, which after an injection you can see causes a just massive increase in the number of CD11B positive cells that are then also high for CD45. So a huge caveat of the protocol as it's published is that the single antigen method would pull down both of these boxes. So you would really be pulling down these true resident brain microglia as well as the peripheral macrophages that have infiltrated into the brain. So what can we do to overcome this issue? Um, an obvious negative of the all or nothing sorting method that you get with a magnetic bead in comparison to fax sorting where you can do CD45 high low is that we really cannot get this fine tuned nature of CD45 high low. We can only pull down yes or no for a particular antigen. So we ran a panel of markers on our CD11B positive population and both when there is a very strong infiltrating component and not. And we consistently found that the CD45 low cells, so the brain microglia, did not express the chemokine receptor CCR2, whereas those that were CD45 high or these infiltrating cells consistently expressed this marker. So what we now do is essentially at the bead isolation method, we're now doing a double step instead of a single step. So. What we're now doing is instead of the single bead isolation, we now first sort for CCR2 negative cells if we want to study only microglia. And then we incubate this negative population with CD11B beads. So this will really result in a CD11B positive CCR2 negative brain microglial population. And of course you can sort also the CCR2 positives to study the um, infiltrating cells into the brain. <coughs> Um, just, I just wanted to quickly touch on one other small thing before handing this off for our next talk, but everything that I showed you previously has been re done really well in mice, but we have also had success in isolating um, microglia from postmortem human brain from fresh frozen postmortem tissue. And this is just a Western blot that we show here that our CD11B positive population expressed the microglial marker IBA1, whereas the negative population does not. And vice versa, the negative population expresses astrocyte and neuron markers GFAP and NUN, whereas our po positive population does not. And we've been able to do um, bulk RNA sequencing and um, full unbiased proteomics using these isolated cells. So they are at least workable enough in order to use for this. We have not tried to culture microglia isolated from the postmortem human brain. I think that the freezing nature of what we've done with that tissue makes it a little difficult for culturing, but you are able to do downstream RNA and protein applications. But in fresh mice brain, we are able to put these cells into culture. And this is just a quick um, TNF ELISA showing that if you stimulate these isolated microglia with LPS, ex vivo, so in culture, we can see that they respond exactly like you would expect microglia to, and they just pump out a ton of TNF, whereas the CD11B negative population um, produces far, far less TNF in response to an LPS stimulation. So I just wanted to thank everyone, including my postdoc mentor, Stacy and uh, Haley Moya, who was really vital in the making of this protocol and getting everything written down so that we can share our steps with you. Thanks.
Hey, thank you so much. That was very clear. And thank you for providing the updates using the CCR2 negative selection to get a pure population of microglia. Now, um, open up for questions. Uh, so feel free to turn on your video, unmute, and ask uh, the questions or comments. So we have a, a quick question in the chat. Um, so for during the, uh, in the percol gradient step, so why not add uh, the 30% percol on top of 70% percol solution? I asked that exact question when I came into the lab <laughs> and Theoretically, I do not know the answer, but in practice, we have a much greater mixing every time that we've done that. I'm not sure if it's just, are, my, are most of our hands not good enough for doing the layering that way? And it's just gentler to underlay, but just about every time I've done this 70-30 per call, I've just found that the yield is much, much better when we do the underlay. But oh. theoretically, I see no reason why that's necessary. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting to know. Yeah. So I have a, a quick question. So for the smaller brain regions, like mm. people campus from a half brain, do sure. you have to pull samples from multiple mice or you can do it separately? So I think a huge part of that is what is your downstream application? Um, I have done sequencing and I've done from a postnatal day 10 prefrontal cortex. So very small. Um, I've been able to do some of those, you know, the 96 well qPCR arrays. I've been able to get enough RNA to do that. Um, if you're going to be using some more plate-based methods that need just much higher proportion of cells, you can pull. And I definitely have pulled before, but just about everything that I've used this for as long as they're several days old, you can get enough. Um, okay. If they're embryonic, I always pull, but yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. And we have another question in the chat. Uh, have you further purified and cultured the CDN11B negative fraction? Yeah, so that's such an interesting question. We have one thing that, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting a cough. That's scary in these days. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but one thing that we've noticed with our CD11B negative population is it's kind of everything else. And especially when you're using the debris removal solution or the Percol gradient, um, you're kind of stripping myelin off of the neurons. And you're, I don't think that there's, it's a true, true neuronal population in the CD11B negative population because you're obviously doing something to these cells to strip the myelin off of them. So we have cultured them and we have done some sequencing on them, but I'm always a little reticent to be confident what's truly in that CD11B negative population. Yeah, I probably could comment a little bit on this. So maybe some people are interested in um, purifying astrocytes, for example. So why not? I will say that I've tried this exact method using the Miltenyi astrocyte beads yeah that's and i've not had a fantastic luck with it okay um i don't know if it's just those particular beads and uh -huh. i haven't given too much extra thought to <laughs> other magnetic beads but those okay. ones haven't worked incredibly well in my hands i see okay. but yeah, someone knows how know. very well please let me know <laughs> okay um if no more questions and thank you thank you again evan thank you Thanks. yeah